Hey, this is Robert of MayflowerBookshop.com. Today I wanted to share with you the importance of writing poetry. It doesn't matter if you're good or not. It doesn't matter about anything other than just that you do it. I think it's really an important thing. How do you write poetry? How do you write like a journal? What is poetry? I think that every day you have to fall in love with something. You have to re you can't just rely on your love from yesterday. You like every day you wake up, you take a deep breath, you sit up straight, inhaling a deep breath. And you sit up straight and let go. Letting go is a huge thing. You can't grasp or regrasp or handle or hold what's going on or you can't grasp what's going on unless you have an empty open hand to grasp we're not talking about self-grasping you hear the airplane going above but it goes through you because you're unless it's important you wake up in the morning and you sit up straight and you take a deep breath and you let go and you can, you're kind of like going back to sleep, but you're not totally going back to sleep and you're not totally waking up. You're in that in-between world, between dawn and evening, between evening and dawn, between light and dark, between conscious and unconscious, between being here and not being here, between wanting to grasp something and letting go. <clears throat> so I think at first, the morning should be a solemn, holy in-breath, followed by a letting go into the world. One gets up, and you get dressed, or you go to the bathroom, or shower, you eat, you straighten up things, but the second that you go into Mother Nature, the second you go into the outer world, all the world is something that we've mothered through many lifetimes to be here. We've created this world. Basically, we eat the whole world, or we breathe it all in and we breathe it out. We sweat. We eat the world and the world eats us. It's kind of that funny in-between place again. But what I'm trying to say is if you want to be a poet and write, which I think everyone should do at the minimum for one's own self-therapy, but at a higher level, one's self-initiation. One's quest for truth. Who am I? What is the world? Where have we been? Where are we going? Where are we now? So the whole secret of, of writing or poetry as illuminative, sacred text is the second you wake up, or maybe it's when you walk out the door, you breathe in the world you see as a whole, and you let little things speak to you. Like I just came outside and I have a couple new yellow roses that are about to bloom and one yellow rose that's bloomed totally in full, its fullness, beautiful. And another yellow rose that's on its way out. It's all real light yellow and <clears throat> looks like an old grandma letting go. And I noticed it, but the thing for some reason I noticed was just some beautiful weeds that have grown, overgrown at the edge and have seeds at the end of their stalks and they're doing their last hurrah and they've made it, they didn't get cut down. <laughs> and they're going in every little direction and the light, slight wind has them waving either to me or the sky or each other. So the secret of writing, I think uh, one of the points I wanted to bring out today was 
in hanging out in the past a little bit with Gary Snyder and a little bit more, a lot more with Robert Bly <clears throat> and then a whole lot with Allen Ginsberg because we were sharing Tibetan Lamas. We'd be, we'd be hanging out. And a lot of my friends and other people I know got to hang out with, with him. And these are guys who all made a lot of popularity and notoriety for their poetry and their thinking. And I thought it was important to mention this. I mean, these poets made a lot of money. I mean, Rilke made enough money to travel and visit friends and have his own life. And I think a lot of us don't have that pleasure of having a lot of time on our hands to go out in the world and objectively, silently, selflessly observe. To a degree we have desire and fear, it influences what we see. So the whole meditation practice of selflessness, the whole meditation practice of emptiness practice or calm abiding space equanimity, I mean that whole idea that each of us is three, we're spirit, soul, body. And in the spirit level, we're one with everything and we're brother and sister to everything. And we'll always be here, past, present, and future, in some kind of eternal now. Spirit, and then soul and body. <clears throat> the body is unique expression of millions of conditioning factors that make us have a, a sense of being here now. Temporary permanence or a painful or pleasurable sense of now. Spirit, soul, body. <clears throat> In the spirit, we're all one. In the spirit, we know everything. We're omnipresent. We're everybody and nobody. We're, we're, we exist in a state of consciousness where everything's a miracle or nothing's a miracle like Einstein thought that when it comes to miracles that everything's a miracle or that nothing's a miracle and these are the two views. But I think there's a view that's a third view, spirit, soul, body. The soul is the psyche, the soul is the, the unconscious soul until we co cognitively, until we awaken our relationship to the universal mind, the manas, or the spirit self of Rudolf Steiner. Until we awaken ourselves to the manas, or the spirit self, the manas of theosophical uh, word. Words are really important. I mean, they help describe something, you know. You can get stuck on the words and not find new words. That's why we want to try to learn about writing poetry or creative vision and feelings. The soul is usually caught up in survival and rhythms of nature, inner, outer, and desire and fear, and a sense of, will I survive, or, or can I grow, can, what's for me, a sense of self of some sort that immediately is going to realize you're in trouble in this world. <laughs> Blavatsky in the theosophy teachings thinks that the earth is the lowest realm there is and that there is no other hell, that this is hell, and that the divine feminine wisdom has fallen from heaven and the uninsightful call it the devil when it comes to earth, but really it's the wisdom of the earth. The proverbs of hell, those funny statements of Mark Twain, William Blake, and others of the torturous trials and tribulations of earth life so that we can gain some kind of insight and wisdom and redeem, for lack of better words, redeem the fallen light that's within us, our true self. Our true self is love and truth and wishing we had a Z and friends and we we're interactive and communicative to the whole garden of life, not just the garden in the backyard, but everybody's yard and everybody's soul. So when the soul identifies with not only pure intention, because pure intention is the, the road to hell is paved with good intention. Good intention will 
if everything blows up, good intention will get you to start again somewhere else. But we need more than that. We need some kind of smarts that puts us in the battle of insight over ignorance, wisdom over ignorance and delusion, love, falling in love with something new every day or renewed every day. So you, you wake up and you come into the world and you take a look. You might wake up and sit up and hear the bird or see something out your window or see something in your room for the first time as if you never saw it before. And some insight into our inner becomings and being, our inner being and stillness and our inner becoming, our inner direction, outward, inward. We go outside. So here's the point. This is what Ginsburg said, is that truth or frankness, frankness dis dispels paranoia. Now, some people talk too much. I might be accused of that at times. And <clears throat> other people don't talk or speak enough or well. Or even the people that talk a lot don't speak well. What I'm talking about is speech united with the world word. Some, a term that Steiner coins. Blavatsky would call it the logos. Perhaps the solar logos. The Christos. In Esoteric Character of the Gospels by Blavatsky... She goes, which is near the end of her life, and she died before finishing it, but she's a really good 20-page or so article <clears throat> on how the word Christ or Christos was there before the word Christ. And that Krishna, C-H-R-I-S-T-N-A, Krishna, or Christos, was there before Christianity, and... Crestos with the E, crest, Crestos was was more like Jesus is every man and Christ is no man, a philosophical love of truth statement. Philosophy means love of truth, love of love, truth of love, probably more, truth of love. <clears throat> the Crestos is the trials and tribulations that purify us and give us insight allow us to want to resurrect. I mean, at a certain point, you get so old, you want to raise your consciousness and go, and, and, and the soul is too big for the body. We don't really die. The soul is, gets too big for the body. Okay, so, hey, is Robert getting lost? <laughs> um, no. So, when the lower mind identifies with the higher mind, I mean, this is like when the desire, comma, rupa, uh, the one that's caught up with the trials and tribulations of the world and sees don't and we don't see enough light we don't have enough insight we're not getting paid enough for we're not getting paid enough for what our work is the work is to discover the truth and love and who am i <clears throat> and we're not getting paid enough isn't money we're not getting paid enough insight and creative wisdom we're not getting paid enough we're not getting enough for our suffering we're not getting paid back. So so when the the mind that goes round and round and can't stop, I mean, it's a real problem when the mind can't stop. The whole idea is waking up from the deep spiritual space we were in or journey we were in during falling asleep and waking up or between death and rebirth. And we try to hold on to our stillness and we see everything as if for the first time. And the secret of writing is some kind of honesty. But how does one get honest? Ginsburg had a couple tricks that were interesting that I wanted to share. And one of them is this kind of like honesty about whatever you see. You hear somebody flush a toilet while you're sitting up and meditating in the other room. Or you think of some negative thing, you know, you see something. And you might just write that down. Flushing toilet. Birds singing outside. I want to go outside. So this idea of, of uh, Ginsburg was that you write down honestly whatever you see, but not long-winded. And you don't add yourself into it. The idea is that when, if I come back, if I come outside and say, roses past, present, future. I'm just reporting what I'm seeing. Half the basil 
is ready to eat and be devoured. The other half is going to seed, thinking of rebirth in a new form, but the same old, same old, same good. Dark blue, purple flowers with yellow core, laughing beyond the basil. Weeds in the corner, dancing in seed, dreaming of flying away, finding a garden, a new garden. Lavender, last of purple rain. I mean, just kind of report. I'll get to Mayflower Bookshop later. And I could report turning signs from closed to open after unlocking the door. Check to see if people called. The past becomes present when I listen to the answer machine. But I don't have to answer everything. I sit down. <clears throat> Sitting down, I'm surrounded by books. Can't get a line on my phone unless I go outside. But I'm staying here in the stillness beyond the waves of the world noise. So right there, I started to dream out. So Ginsburg's trick was that you write down whatever you see. I mean, if you get stuck, you got to see something else and you got to hold still. So I think it's a weaving of holding still between the miracle of seeing things as if for the first time and hearing their voice, like hearing the voice of, of plants and animals and trees and stones and you know, I could have come outside and looked down and said, <clears throat> a thousand tiny rocks cemented to the ground. I stand on stones. Can't dig in here. I look to the sky. So that could have stopped right there as a poem, maybe. And all I'm doing is I'm describing whatever I see until I can't stand it anymore. And you'll see that you describe actual facts, like you, like Ginsburg trick, another Ginsburg trick, which which Bly and um, Snyder, I think, were hip to. <clears throat> if you you describe exactly what you see, but Ginsburg had even went further. Um, Alan Ginsburg would like. He had, he had the idea that you would describe um, the littlest, the most insignificant thing in the room. Like right now, if you look around you, you could look inwardly too, but it's always better to be outward because if you describe an outer thing, not a subjective, not a feeling, you describe an outer thing. And some poets think that since the atomic bomb, we can't just rhyme and we can't just feel stuff and we can't dream into it that you have to it's like it's over objectified that the earth is disintegrating due to pollution and war and <clears throat> the misuse by humankind mankind not rather than the right use by humankind and <clears throat> because the earth is di is disappearing we're like reporters who are reporting what still exists here Imagine if we only described our feelings and people read it a thousand years from now. Like think back a thousand years from now in the past or 2000 or 4000. 3000 BC when matriarchies probably were in their last hurrah of running, running the world with a kind of a mothering thing, gardening thing, taking care of the family, culture, community thing, taking care of the land thing. Before really tough intellect came in maybe a little bit in the Egyptian era, but Greek, Roman, um, the Middle Ages, along with kind of a mystical uh, pagan revival of Plato, Aristotle, and sacred architecture. All that stuff happened in the Middle Ages, the high Middle Ages and the Renaissance, and we got more and more intellectual, especially in the late 1800s with the this discovery and we could have discovered some other energy but discover electricity and <clears throat> machines and the industrial age and 
mechanisms and all the way through creating the bomb. So the secret of writing is very simple. Every day, try to put yourself in nature or the workplace or your home or your backyard or the shopping. <laughs> put yourself somewhere out there and stop. Stop yourself. You have to have a place where you can stop yourself and pull out a pencil and pen or pencil, yeah, a pen and paper. There's something receiving. It's better to write down too, at least at first, because if you talk, you, there's a tendency to say too much. I wanted this to be a five, 10 minute thing and I'm already going over 20 minutes. So paper and pen or pencil, and you write down the most insignificant thing and you try to describe it as well as you can. Cobweb near the corner of the house an invisible resident lives there. The tiniest bug can get caught in the web. And the Lord of the house shows up. Like this. We make a little coin or gold or pleasure. And we show up to eat it, see it, hold it, smile with it. Or is it the little pain that we have that disturbs the web of our world, the aura of our world? And we come out to see if we can disengage it. We either sit in our web without moving, or we explore the emptiness of the world around us and our own, of our own making. I'm just making this up, you know trying to describe the web. So <clears throat> what happens is you get to a place where you can't describe, you jump. I mean, at some point I might make a comment that I'm the web or I'm the spider or whatever, you know, you, you, get, you can get carried away. And so whenever you get carried away when describing the least significant, the quiet brick, red and brown, speaks to me this morning without a sound. One thing about like writing songs that's really great for me, I love writing songs because you can rhyme. Everybody lets you rhyme. The Beatles and the Rolling Stones and those 60s invasion by the British invasion of music. <clears throat> uh, and Elvis Presley, you know, for that matter, and Buddy Holly. And, you know, there was like a, in the 50s and 60s, and there's lots of music before I know, but we awaken. In music, you can rhyme. I think poetry will find its rhyme again when it has more honesty and truth. And um, some music refuses to rhyme and just wraps it out and sparkles it out with music and an array of diverse waves on the ocean. There's a physical fact to it and timing and limitation of how long you can talk or sing a song or write a poem or when you can get away with doing it, when you can make time for yourself and a poem or a little jotto of, like if I'm just writing a little journal, you know, basil, roses, quiet red bricks, weeds in the corner, trying to forget or are they jumping to some new future that has not been yet? See, I'm just making that up. As I go, I'm just looking around. <clears throat> so a lot of like this poetic writing is just looking around and reporting. And I think at first you got to keep it short. You got to like think five, 10 minutes, 15 minutes at the most. But you do it regularly every day. The whole idea is in meditation, you sit up straight, take a deep breath in and sit up straight and let go of your breath and let go of yourself and go empty. You're not going to sleep and you're not dreaming and wandering and you're not sinking or flying away. You're sitting up straight with no thought, listening with your heart. And that's part of the big secret. The big, big secret is to be still in your heart and to feel the heart of everything else. In the plant, of course, you'd have to think about it, how the plant lives for a whole year to see its heartbeat. With the bird, 
<clears throat> there's a unique expression that belongs to all that type of bird and perhaps to all birds and to see their year cycle or two and a half years. So I'm probably getting a little lost here. I mean, to be able to hear angels and write what their doings are. Um, <clears throat> when Whitman writes about miracles in his poem, Miracles, he writes about so many things that are happening in Mother Nature all at once. And, and if, you, if you write about what you're seeing and you don't put yourself in the poem, you'll find yourself in the poem. You find yourself in the writing. If you just write about and report what you see, you're going to fi later find yourself in that writing. If you try to impose yourself in it, you know, like I like the rose, I'm going to eat the basil. <laughs> the basil is really coming along. If I start putting myself into it, I'll lose myself. But if you just report what's there, you'll discover kind of another self that you have that is kind of a reporter and kind of a once removed. vantage point. <clears throat> there's the physical body and there's the etheric body of rhythms and motion and, and cosmic, cosmos, nature, rhythms of seasons and day seasons and breath seasons and heartbeat rhythms. There's all these rhythms that we can get caught in. The movement of the wind with the Queen Anne's Lace right now. The Queen Anne's Lace, you know, it's like a weed to most people. And I pull a lot of it and don't let it grow, but I let it grow in certain places. And so on the edge of this little garden I have in the front and in the back, it grows and it's, it's, it's like not the prettiest thing, but then it opens up and it's got this flat, as if it exists floating in the air, solar system, cosmos of gla galaxies in this flat openness to the sky and kind of like a anti-gravity refusal of the, of the earth. It just floats in the center. And everything, the sky and the rhythms of the planets and stars and the earth conspired together <clears throat> so that this Queen Anne's Lace could have this moment between the sky and earth. Is that not what all roses do and all flowers? All flowers give us an idea of our own flowering, that we're between earth and sky and this no man's land, we flower with some kind of insight and truth and beauty and goodness that we share with everybody and nobody. The miracles are everywhere and nowhere. But here in writing poetry and writing a journal, we have to just report facts. Like on a journal level, you know, Hard to get up, took a breath, sat up, made green tea, went outside. The sun told me to be still and know everything and nothing. So, I mean, you know, I could write a journal like that. There's a thousand things I see to do, but I'm not doing one of them. I'm going to do nothing. No thing can hold me, yet everything is beautiful, insightful, and wishes to play. So again, when you write, you just try to as best you can to write objects, and then you, when you go completely crazy, you might slip and say something. I love it all, you know. I wish you were here. All that stuff, you know. I got to get some more tea. Oh my gosh, the bumblebee. A lone mosquito by the edge of the bush wishes that I was closer and thus we would meet on unholy, unholy ground. Who would bite who? An unholy sound. I don't know. I'm just making. So that's the thing is you want to write about the object. And if you don't know what object to pick and you're writing, if you write about the real beautiful object, the most important thing in the room, you're going to have problems. Uh, fitting it into everybody's heart and mind. So you write about the most insignificant thing. And a lot of poets and writers and songwriters kind of do that. I think they might overdo it. You know, I mean, I know some writers and they write about the rocking chair and their grandmother's shawl. And they write about this like 
th- that you think is tradi- you think it's cute and it's cool and I wish I had a rocking chair and I wish I had a my grandmother was still here. Yeah, you might identify with it. <clears throat> and it gives that nostalgia. And I'm not saying it's bad, but I think because the world's in such trouble today, instead of like trying to blame people for who poisoned the river, I think as a poet and a writer, we should just report that the, you can't drink the water and you don't re- let other people figure out who did it. So, I mean, it's probably a terrible thing to say at this moment, but a lot of my friends are wrecking their life criticizing other people and trying to make people bad or or they make people too too good and they they pop them up as a god and then they're let down that the god can't be a god all the time everything's impermanent i mean that's why a lot of um writers and poets have studied tibetan buddhism the book of the dead the egyptian book of the dead too that we're the dead until we're raised in consciousness that our 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 spiritual body our soul and our mind heart is over identified with form and pleasure and pain and what we have to do to survive and get through this day and still have a bed tomorrow morning. I mean, there's there's a lot of that. So that's why meditation and <clears throat> reading some deep books from the Mayflower Bookshop on all the various spiritual mind virtue mind trainings from Neoplatonism to Hermetics, ancient Egypt alchemy, Celtic, Tibetan Buddhism, Theosophy, Rudolf Steiner's Anthroposophy, Hinduism, Jainism, Raja Yoga, Yana Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, the Bhagavad Gita that Gandhi studied to free India. I mean, when you read these sacred texts, the Rig Veda, the Upanishads, when you read these sacred texts that people tried to put down so that we could have some kind of map to the astral plane and the spiritual world. I think, again, one of the problems I've been seeing with different spiritual groups, or even poets and writers and songwriters, is they're stuck in one or two schools. A lot of the people that are making money off their knowledge, scientific, philosophical, spiritual, creative, um, get hooked on it. And they get hooked on the people and the scene. And, and, and it just, you know, when the COVID thing came, you really got, you really started to get um, who could be happy with just themselves, death and rebirth. Who could be happy? I mean, what is happiness? I mean, happiness is we see the eternal in each other. Steiner says that the color, the flower isn't permanent, the color is, and that it comes back, the colors keep coming back again and again, and they take new form and, and even similar form for sometimes hundreds of thousands of years. So, so today, I'm trying to encourage you to write. We, if everybody wrote songs every day, concert tickets would be really cheap and not crowded. Each day must be conquered anew. Each day is a new song and adventure. And out of freedom, I look again and fall in love with everything I see. I think especially you see that when you're a little baby and you're under three, you're under four, you're under five years old, you're under seven years old. And you can see how the child is just still one with all nature and is not bummed out. Somebody dies... And they, they smile, throw a kiss, and keep going, laughing. Because in our hearts, we're always united. In our soul, we can choose to always be united with truth and love and universality. Universal mind, universal compassion, love, universal truth. Blavatsky's statement for the Theosophical Society, there is no religion higher than truth. And we're living at a time where it's the war of all against all, like revelations and the apocalypse says we're we're getting we're having apocalyptic times, but we're not having enough revelations so that we can sing a beautiful song, and we should be able to sing on the way in and on the way out, and on the way back again. When we can inspire each other to see the eternal, in the good, true, and beautiful, which Plato said was the experience of deity, coming to light. The Egyptian Book of the Dead was the coming forth by day, deity. The Tibetan Book of the Dead was the same thing that we see the illusion in Maya of the world. Steiner said it, the Tibetans, the Hindus say it. And we hold still long enough until something arises 
that is a Buddha nature, a Christ, Christos, Christ nature, a Krishna nature, a Hermes, higher self, eternal spiritual spark, knowing the stillness that weaves through awe and the love that weaves through awe. Again, you can see the way I'm talking now is losing the object. So the whole goal of being a writer is to stick with the object. I wake up, get my green tea, sit in the front of my house behind a bush. I can hear the planes. I can hear people cutting trees, cutting down bushes distant. I can hear lawnmowers. I can hear cars traveling. I hear planes going overhead. All these noises and sounds are trying to stop me from writing and talking to you. But I'm, I refuse to <laughs> get lost. And I'm talking to you. We need to write new songs. We need to rewrite history so that it's a passageway to everyone getting enlightened. No one's evil. They're all children of God. They're all children of the great goddess and mother. They're the, they're the children of, let's reframe that. They're the children of trueness in the becoming, goodness that wants to be. They're the sons and daughters of the mother of all life, compassion and love. And we're the weavers. We're the spokesmen and the spokeswoman. <laughs> we're the spokes and the wheel from the center to it all. Our center is nowhere. Our circumference is everywhere. The great mother is, is everything and everything matters. The great father is nothing we can see and experience beyond our perception. A causeless cause and a rootless root, a space within all things. In the roots, in the open sky we're trying to open to, nothing is there so that we can become everything. There's room for us to move. So I'm hoping that all of us can become poets. The ancient Celts, before a big war was going to take place, the poet philosopher would come with the warrior or two into the valley between the big mountains facing each other that are accumulating warriors and fighters and weapons. And before the war would happen, before the fight would happen, the poet would read poetry, philosophy, truth, and start to see little things and describe the beauty and what's all around us, and we're going to wreck it with war. Unless each one of us becomes a pilgrim, spiritual soul, a poet, a songwriter, a lover of everything and nothing, so we can be free. I mean, the idea is that emptiness practice can free you from attachment and the Klingons are the bad guys in Star Trek. I mean, this clinging to form. We can love a thousand times more, my first spiritual friend and teacher and mentor said. I was like, you know, 21 or something, 20. 22, and he was like in his 80s, and he, he said, you can love a thousand times more, but don't be attached to the form it takes. That exclusive love was killing us and that we're here for everybody, everything, everybody. Exclusive love breeds selfishness, which kills love in time. So the, the meditation that I'm presenting for journal and writing and poetry is that we, we make three times a day, at least once a day, for three to five minutes, 15 minutes, right? If you meditate, like in my talk, how to save the world in three minutes a day, you just meditate for three to four minutes, you know? And I think that if you have a piece of paper ready and you can sit yourself still, inside or outside, and you just report for three to five minutes and jot down things you see, Later, when you go back to it, you're going to see, you find yourself in there, some kind of insight that's trying to emerge from the objects you put together. So I hope I got through to you. This is something that you do by yourself. You can't do it with other people. Other people are too distractive. I think when you meditate, you have to have a direct conversation with God. Otherwise, those other people and you are wrecking the world. And unless we can find, we can divine the divine within ourselves by being still and quiet enough 
to see a new truth. I'm not sure where the world's going. It seems like, you know, the world's ending prematurely and very quickly. And it's not bad that the world ends prematurely. The difficulty is that we're not really ready, many of us aren't ready to enter the spiritual worlds. Um, a lot of people die, like Plato talked about, incidental and accidental death. Incidental death is when we choose to go. Accidental death is we just, we die. And whether that it takes a year or two or it takes a couple of seconds or minutes or months or days, accidental is we just go and we didn't really plan on it. Incidental is that we kind of know it's time to go and it doesn't matter how we go. <clears throat> and imagine... Well, I guess what I'm imagining is that the human potential, the inner human being, the heart of what it means to be a human being has not fully flowered with wisdom and an intense, great love for everything, all God's creation, that everything is part of a holiness of God's symphony of poetry and music. Everything is part of a great song. And I think that Einstein tried to see that, you know. He tried to see, tried to discover the unified field theory and was reading The Secret Doctrine by Vygotsky. Steiner read it. Manley Hall read it. Pretty much everybody at my bookstore that wrote anything after the late 1800s read Blavatsky. The Secret Doctrine, her Isis Unveiled, her Key to Theosophy, her Voice of the Silence. And Steiner came out of that. An outline of occult science is his version of The Secret Doctrine. And um, his Rosicrucian Wisdom, The Seven Planetary Conditions, and his Rosicrucian Wisdom, yeah, and Path of Self-Knowledge, The Seven Levels of Consciousness and Bodies that Come Out of the Seven Planetary Conditions. I mean, these are big things to study for any poet and writer. And what we have is people writing scary movies in Hollywood and that have no wisdom insight, don't teach you how to meditate, don't teach you how to have organic gardens that don't kill the earth. They don't teach you how to heal yourself so we're like way overloaded at hospitals. They don't believe in the self as a, as a God in the becoming. And like Jesus says, do you not know ye are gods in becoming? And Jesus quotes the Old Testament that when they're accusing him of healing people, raising the dead awareness into a living one. He says, you know, that, that, that it's the Old Testament that says, ye are gods in the becoming, and he repeats it for now. To the ancient Neoplatonic Hermetic teachings, Gnostic teachings, the gods were the virtues, that each of us has these different qualities and virtues you know, I mean, I think in the spiritual virtue mind training of Tibetan Buddhism and Blavatsky's Voice of the Silence, there's seven virtues. The human being was never meant to be denser than the fragrance of a flower. And we've, for the, the sake of freedom and new learning, we've entered perishable forms. The human eternal golden thread of many lifetimes See, a bug just landed on my shoulder. <laughs> a fly or something just landed on my shoulder, you know, and you have these instincts um, to nail it to the cross, more or less. And, uh, you know, I've got this Buddhist side that's going to gently swish it away, which I did. In, in some early spiritual trainings I had, you weren't supposed to kill any bugs or anything for a month or a week or at least three days. There's all these things to do to quicken our awareness. We can fast, we can eat the purest food, we can catch our mind so that it doesn't wander and sink and fly away. We can, we can ponder nature. I can hear the plane go by, but it doesn't, I don't go with it. I hear the birds squawking and I hear the, I see the flies and the bugs flying around the different flowers and the, the hornets and the, 
I saw a honeybee the other day, which is rare these days because they're dying from the monoculture and pesticides. Unless we can hold still, we don't have any room for anything outside of ourselves. And each person is selfishly trying to make their happiness and avoid their pain. And we're accidentally doing each other and rubbing each other the wrong way. So I think the beginning here, I'm trying to in spark and inspire and invoke you to meditate for three to five minutes a day and to write down for three to five minutes a day if, and maybe even for three times a day. You'll hold still and you'll write down. And, and Ginsburg also said that you should write in a way that nobody's going to see it. You write down, you have to be free to write. I mean, you can write down at the beginning of your journal, um, <clears throat> everything I'm saying here is make-believe, I'm trying to write a movie script, so that it gives you permission if anybody does ever read your stuff that you've already said you're just making it up, you know. But but some people have enough privacy that a lot of people don't trust anything. They don't trust anything. They don't trust themselves. And we got to get over that. We have to learn how to trust ourselves so that the true spiritual soul can interact. The true love and truth can interact with every day in the littlest way. See, that accidentally right After you, like, rhyme a, a bit, it starts coming to you, you know. After you write... Um, three to five minutes a day on the objects, you start to notice things more. I think that the number one way to notice spiritual things around you is to hold still. So to me, most of us lack stillness. I do meet people occasionally that are super sensitive and they hold still all the time and they wish they could find their voice and they wish they could find their right action and their right job and their right lover and their right friend. And Yeah, I see that. Okay, i got to go get my dog. He's wandering too far. Uh, the wandering mind dog and the wandering feeling cat, pussy cat. So I hope that I've sparked you to join me in being a creative writer and artist. Bless your heart. This is Robert of MayflowerBookshop.com. Feel free to subscribe. Please subscribe or donate or share or tell people about this. Make it your own and just do your own version of this and help people to be creative artists for a better future for all of us. Bless your heart. MayflowerBookshop.com.